First, let me thank you all for the invitation to come and speak. This is a great honor. I'm very pleased to be here and very pleased that there's interest in the subject. Um, I wanted to maybe first start by saying that I find myself uh, very surprised to be here uh, in the sense that when I was growing up, uh, I often looked at businesses as the cause of a number of problems, largely pollution, I suppose. And I went into journalism when I was younger with the view that um, if we could just tell the people you know, what's going on, we could get businesses to do the right thing. And somewhere along that journey, my mind changed. And I thought, instead of trying to tell businesses what to do, why not set up our own businesses and do it properly? Uh, but nevertheless, to, to kind of be promoting uh, green business, I find a, a bit of a contradiction. And hopefully I can explain that a little bit more. Uh, the company that I'm now running, One Earth Innovation, is an eco-incubator, and I've been doing it now for about 16, 17 years. And one of the things I'll be talking to you are really, the, you know, what are the lessons that I've learned over that time that might help those in this audience and other entrepreneurs, whether they're social entrepreneurs or eco-entrepreneurs, uh, what are the lessons that can help them succeed? So that's the, I'll come to that actually the, the last third of this presentation. The second thing I will come to is, how do you make a green product? What, what have I learned about how that can be done? And that's been a very interesting journey as well. But what I'm going to start with is, in the French, they say the raison d'etre. Why, why is it important to be doing this? And many of you will already know that. But I think it's, uh, it's worth revisiting, because I think times have changed. I think that certainly, you know, 30, 50 years ago in the era of our grandparents, green business might not have resonated. I think that has now changed and we can, it is, the time has come. So whether you are an environmentalist or you are a business person who only wants to profit, uh, a green business is smart. I'm going to start that uh, story by going back to something I learned when I was 14 and in American high school, I'm from Seattle, uh, we were given a petri dish full of what's called agar. It's a gelatin made of seaweed, and we would sprinkle bacteria on it. And, and the question was, well, will it survive, and how fast will it grow? So every day we'd come back and we'd look at the petri dish, and at first not much happened. And then all of a sudden we started to see the splotches that you see now. And it was growing, it was prospering, it was doing well. And a few days into the experiment, we came in and the bacteria had done extremely well. It had covered the entire petri dish. It, it had won. It was, uh, it was a success story. I, I assume you all can predict where I'm going with this. Two days later, we come back into biology class and we look in the petri dish and it's all gone. The bacteria had done so well, it had eaten up all of the resource and then it collapsed. I can guess some of you will predict my next slide. The question is, is that analogy, that scientific experiment, fair for humans' relationship with the Earth? Some people would argue that it's not, but I actually think it's, uh, it's a very fair uh, analogy, and I think it's an important one. In 1972, the United Nations, through the Club of Rome, published a report called Limits to Growth. And in that report, they tracked five different uh, trajectories of the economy. The first part of it was humans. What was population growth? And as you can see here, it's been growing quite rapidly. It's tripled since the end of World War II. This is global population. The other metric was industrial output. How much is our, our businesses needing to produce to provide the things that humans want uh, and need? The third one was pollution. It was rising alongside. The more we produced, the more pollution that was occurring. And simultaneous to that, going the other way, was resources. The more we produced, the less natural resources were available. And it was actually quite precipitous. And the final one is food. As resources were running out and pollution was increasing, they forecast that at some point we're going to reach a peak and a peak of what the environment can support and that food will decline dramatically. And the net consequence of all of that, the important one for all of us in this room, is that the population will crash. Now was this 
just a lot of um, anxious uh, con you know, conjecture. Well, the sad truth is that this forecast, which is nearly 50 years old now, is being continually updated and proven accurate. And I think the population is the one key piece of that. So this issue of the possibility of our great uh, economic success as, a, as a, you know, a, a planet of entrepreneurs and consumers actually coming to an end, it should be frightening. More frightening is that it's happened throughout history. In Polynesia, or Polynesian sailors years ago had said a, a small handful had landed on an island in the South Pacific called Rapa Nui. The English call it Easter Island. And when they landed there, it was a, a, a tropical paradise. It had enormous trees. It was a, 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 a beautiful jungle island. And for 400 years, the small band of sailors and, and the people that landed there prospered. And the population grew over a couple hundred years to 20,000. But in that time, the settlers had chopped, began chopping down trees to build fishing boats. And they also began chopping down trees to move those giant head sculptures that we've all seen for cultural purposes. The problem was that eventually they chopped down all the trees. And when that happened, they could no longer build more fishing boats and they could no longer, and, and without trees, the soil began to erode. So farming started to decline. And what this all led to ultimately was starvation. And when that happened, the population dropped by 90%. By the time European sailors had landed there, the population was under 2,000. So it's a bit of a, a cautionary tale. Uh, and now we can look at those symbols and think of them maybe a little differently. Is it what could happen to all of us in our modern economy? The Stockholm Resilience Institute has asked that question. And they've measured or they've suggested that we look at 12 key factors that could lead to the ecological collapse on Earth that underpins our economy or, and, and you know, human uh, existence. And you can see in red, in some of these, we're already pushing the boundary or exceeding it. So this, it's a very serious conversation. Um, one analogy that helped paint this picture slightly differently came out in the World Sust uh, Sustainable Summit uh, in Johannesburg, I believe it was where they asked the question, if everyone on Earth lived like the average American, how, many natural res how much natural resources would be required? And the conclusion was quite startling. Five Earths, which obviously we don't have. So obviously one lesson is Americans need to stop consuming so much. But the, the bigger problem is that the rest of the world also want a good standard of living. Who, wants, who doesn't want that? And what are the consequences of this happening? Well, I think the, the previous slides illustrate that. So that's all the bad news. The good news is, in my view, there is a way out of this. And the short version of it is eco-innovation. The, the, the funny thing is, I don't think it's government. I think government has a big role to play, and I think government helping groups like us get together is a part of that, certainly. But the people that can change this dynamic are businesses and business people. If we can invent ways of providing the, 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 the lifestyle that we would like without trashing the planet, well, then that's got to be the goal. Um, and I've got a, a, I suppose my favorite example of this wasn't set up by an environmentalist or an eco-entrepreneur. It was just a, a, regular, a regular entrepreneur. But his one company is achieving, in my view, more than all the environmental groups combined have achieved. Um, and he's doing it through brilliant innovation. And, and so most of you may have heard of it, Tesla. But in addition to his cars, he's building solar panels for the entire roof with tiles. He is building solar uh, or battery packs that would fit on every house, which will mean every house can get off of the grid. No more coal, no more central uh, electricity. And there will be excess electricity to run all of our transport. Wow. The auto industry, who you would think would have done this, they weren't paying attention or they didn't care. And I think that's why this group of people, or eco-entrepreneurs, are critical. I think we can't leave it. We can't rely on existing businesses to give up their incredible financial powerhouse companies 
to make the changes. We do need disruption, and that's why I think innovation is a, a key aspect of this. So I'm now going to go back to those planetary boundaries, but I'm going to talk about them in terms of opportunities. I believe that I don't think that's happening today, but I believe if, if I was teaching business school, this would be the first thing I would have students look at. What are the areas of, that are going to lead to the, you know, the implosion of the environment? What can we do to solve it? And what businesses can we build to deliver that? Or what existing businesses can we uh, improve so we're not having a negative impact? And I, I'll, I'll go back to Tesla. I don't think Tesla in the 1970s may have done that well. But 30, 40 years on, the majority of the public in our generation is beginning to be aware that something is wrong. I think climate change has been a big piece of that. Before, clim before Al Gore's climate change film, I'm not sure Tesla would have done well. Now, everyone wants one. Everyone wants to not be part of that problem. And I think every one of these issues if properly communicated, could achieve that same support from the public. In other words, green business is, could be highly profitable, highly successful business. So I'm going to run through these. Try, I'll try to be fairly quick. I won't dwell on climate change. I think we've all heard about that. But the other items on that list, I believe, have the potential to have as much profile and be as successful for those dealing with them um, and I'm going to talk about a project that we ran with Blue Water when we had, we, we asked the question, well, how can we sell water in good conscience if we're environmentally minded and be contributing to climate change? So we worked on reducing our carbon footprint as much as we could and then offsetting the remainder. But in doing so, we became the lowest carbon drinks company in the market. And we decided to create a little logo that represented that and we humanized it. I'll talk about why we did that in the marketing uh, section. But the potential for, taking, for doing good work and then promoting that as a, a new USP or unique selling point to a market that's interested in it can actually be very uh, uh, useful in business and it really drove our sales. So it was good for the environment, it was good for our bottom line. Moving on to the other items, uh, ocean acidification. Most of you probably haven't heard much about this. It's caused by the same thing that causes climate change. It's more CO2 is absorbed into the ocean. It's changing the pH of the ocean and it's affecting marine life. It's another angle. It's another issue that can be used to engage the public uh, and differentiate your company. Most people in the world are now living in cities and air pollution, as we all know, is a major factor. How many companies right now can we think of that are you know, making this a central part of their communication campaign? I can't think of any. So why not? It's a huge issue, huge opportunity. Um, <laughs> uh, maybe somebody will get there one day. Uh, ozone we have heard about, and this actually was an area where the government stepped in. I think it was the Montreal Protocol and, and cut out CFCs and has had a huge impact. But it's not an entirely, the issue has not entirely gone away. So it's again an area where businesses could uh, step up and do something and benefit the environment and their, and their business. Fertilizers are, are one of the items that the Stockholm Resilience Institute says is actually at that critical point. There's two big factors here. One is the nitrogen runoff is creating dead zones in the sea and killing huge numbers of fish and marine life. Um, the other is that phosphorus one of the th is one of the three main fertilizers and the known phosphorus reserves are forecast to run out this century. And if that happens, if we don't find more reserves or find alternative ways of agriculture, that alone will cause the collapse of, uh, of food supplies that is forecast. So here's an opportunity for innovation. Chemicals, a personal bugbear. There are 90,000 man-made chemicals now on the market. Of these, according to the American Center for Disease Control, only 5,000 have been tested for neurotoxicity or carcinogens. And of those 5,000, 40% have, 2,000 of them, have shown to be neurotoxins or carcinogens. So, if you extrapolate out, there are 85,000 chemicals, 40% of which uh, arguably are going to be really bad for us, and yet they're on the market. 
Well, what can we do about that? Here's a company that has done something about it and is now you know, a multi-hundred pound or hundred dollar, uh, million dollar business method. They just simply went to a category and said, we're just going to avoid all of these unknown chemicals and new, use natural materials. When you walk into the supermarket, that philosophy could be done with every product on the shelf. It's fairly simple. Um, water, we all uh, understand the issues here. The United Nations forecast that the, by the middle of the century, so we're not far off of that, that there, we will run out, the planet will run out of excess capacity fresh water. So again, a huge barrier, but a huge opportunity for low water intensive uh, manufacturing and business models. Uh, in, in our case, this is the, the drinks company that I set up uh, in the UK. And just to talk about the marketing for a second, we committed to f use our profits to fund clean water projects and our sales shot up. The public is aware of this. They don't know what to do about it, but any company stepping up and saying, and I'm not saying, and actually I don't even know if giving all one's profits away is the best way of doing, uh, running a business. It has some some big deficits. But it did prove that the market is very open and supportive of this type of thinking. Land use, briefly, is uh, urbanization and uh, the sprawl of, of, of building onto land and topsoil runoff. That is as big of an ecological risk as the fertilizer issue. Uh, if the top, topsoil goes, so goes agriculture, or modern agriculture anyway. And I'm coming back to this slide for a reason. The, the area that has the biggest red blotch, which is the, uh, obviously a warning sign, is biodiversity loss. And as in the number of species that are running out. It is expected that, for a, that in the lifetime of a child born today, by the time they die, half the species on the planet will also have died. That's profound. So a child born today, by the time they're old, half the species will be gone. We don't want to be one of them, but it's quite sad that that's the legacy of our economy. And more than sad, it's, it's, you know, it's, it should be a, a warning sign and, and a, maybe a, a, a war cry to do something about it. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry for getting up and sounding like a, a green hippie. I am one, but uh, uh, we'll get to business in a second. Lastly, everyone can appreciate resources. If we run out of resources, whatever business sector we're in, our business ends. The good news on resources, and, and we've had a, quite a few people talking about it, and, and quite a few entrepreneurs here, working on the circular economy model, the cradle to cradle. So there is no waste. We use waste to make more things. And so I, I feel this is one area where actually businesses is rallying and doing a lot. Um, but there's plenty more, obviously, to be done. So in the center of this, this slide, I have that uh, atom diagram that says eco-insight. That, in my mind, represents all of those previous slides. If, if business schools made sure that every student coming out knew all of that, then when they stepped into whatever business they're setting up, they would be, you know, have a lot of, they'd be like a piano, they could play any tune on the piano. They would have all of the information they needed to say, okay, so how do we green this company? And this, to me, is that question. How do we make, how do we create the greenest possible companies? Well, the, the, the starting point is to have that knowledge set of where are the key areas. It might be a little boring uh, to some, but it's, I believe it is essential. But then the fun part starts. Now that we know what we have to solve, now we ask the question within our business, and I've created a, a, a simple life cycle diagram, starting with, well, why do we need the product in the first place? How could we design it in a more intelligent way? What materials we're using? What's the manufacturing process? How do we cut out waste, cut out energy consumption? Uh, how do we reduce logistics and, uh, again, transport? Big one is staff and culture. A lot of people in companies have never, this hasn't been a priority, but if, if they realize it was a priority and if management was listening to their creative ideas, who knows what great ideas could come out from, from the community in the office? Accounting, massive. We uh, don't account for the environment in our businesses. It's just, it's not even legally required. Shocking. Um, 
because the true cost is that a lot of businesses that seem profitable, if you actually included what it's doing to the long-term balance sheet of the planet, might not be. So that's a great opportunity for uh, kind of inventing new business models. Sales and marketing is also huge. One of the, the soap industry, I think Unilever, Procter & Gamble, when they did a life cycle assessment, the initial assumption was, well, what, are, are we using chemicals that aren't you know, good for consumers? What's our packaging like? But they actually, when they looked at the usage of their product, the biggest impact for the, certainly the shampoo companies was the time that people were in the shower, the energy and the heat of, of heating that water. So it's just kind of a surprising to them, it's surprising to me. And so thinking about the, the, how customers use our product, reuse them, and ultimately at the end of that journey is the, the, the circular part. And can we get the products back? How can we repurpose them? So that combination of really paying attention to the life cycle of your business, and really paying attention to the environmental issues that I talked about, um, and beyond that, I can give no advice. This is down to investigation, and it's down to creativity and research. And it's, every business has an opportunity to do this. Hopefully, the starting part of this gives the motivation. There's a great opportunity here. So I'm going to park that. Let's see how time I'm doing. I'm about halfway through. Uh, the green innovation is the section we've, we've covered. I'm going to move on to equally important issues. So what good is it to make a green product if no one buys it. It could be the greenest product, but if no people don't want it, we're not going to have the impact that's needed. So finding ways of, I call it blue marketing, not green marketing, and I'll explain why in a second. Green doesn't always sell. And the reason for that, and this is data that came, comes from a study of consumers in the United Kingdom, but I think it's you know, largely applicable internationally. I'm sure there's variations in different parts of the world. And in the study, they looked at ethical consumption and, and sustainable consumption. I call it just green, you know, I, I've summarized that as dark green consumers being 4%, light green consumers being 16 so together about 20%. And that actually for some industries is all you need. You could have a great business if you had 20% of the market, wonderful. But we're not going to have the change that's needed if we don't get the majority. And of course, every company wants to get the majority. And I call these consumers blue consumers. They do care about the environment, but they also care about the price and quality of a product. They're not going to sacrifice much. And they're not going to pay too much more. They're not going to take a product they don't really like. So actually, the starting point on marketing to them is making sure your product is really good. And I'm going to give you kind of, I'm going to walk you through the thought process of how we did that with blue water and, and again in the thought process of a new product we're about to launch just to give you a sense of how that plays out. But before getting there, I'm just going to back up to some basic psychology. The, when they look back at the evolution of the human brain, our earliest ancestors were reptiles and we had a, a very you know, small brain stem that was, for, was where our instincts reside, fight or flight, hunger, survival. It's still with us, and it's a very powerful part of our, our thinking. As our ancestors evolved into mammals, so cats and dogs, they, we created a limbic system, a slightly larger part around the brainstem. And those species lived in groups. They, had, they were emotional, they were, group survival was important. So what people thought of them, how, how, and, and empathy towards others was, was a very powerful part of that. And that, in my simple model here, it's, it, as you know, it's more complicated in reality, is where the emotions lie. Sadly for environmental businesses, the part of the brain that deals with abstract thought, like in a hundred years we might run out of clean water or, or sooner than that, is the neocortex. But it's the least persuasive of our in, innate uh, thought processes. So the, the simple kind of metaphor that looking at this uh, kind of has, the way it's shaped my thinking is that if we, the more abstract green thinking we can move from, from that thought part of our brain into the emotional, the more successful we will be. If we can make it an instinctive and emotional decision, we'll do better. 
So how did we do it with blue water? And I'm just going to, I'll show you this, uh, my prop. I'll explain this bottle in a second. What we made sure we did is that in our brand thinking, our design thinking, and so forth, we always were paying attention that the quality aspects and the price aspects of the product were being given as much attention as our eco agenda, which sometimes seems counterintuitive. People think, oh, a green product, we're going to, you'll notice that we didn't, well, I'll show you a slide in a second. We didn't put a picture of the earth on the product. How many people want to drink a bottle that says Greenpeace? Not a lot. Um, you know, we took, this is a, a long conversation, but I'll summarize it. We then said, well, what does quality look like? Price is pretty easy to understand. Sometimes green products can be cheaper, sometimes more expensive. But quality is one you have to pay a lot of attention to. So we looked at the performance, the style of the design, appearance. Uh, in our case, we went to every, drink, uh, every mineral well in the UK, over 70. So we had a really interesting story to tell about the product. And importantly, we also got some excellent design work. And uh, there's a one uh, diamond at the bottom called status. Now, status is a big part of why we buy things. The, market, the professional marketers know this well. It's by why we buy a lot of things. And if we can make our green products high status, well, that's a, a great way of of getting people to, to support what you're doing. Um, just because it's an inter I find this an interesting slide, what we then asked was, well, how does that manifest? How, does that, how do we actually put that thinking into practice? And we created in the left-hand column a list of the main communication channels. So what's the name of the product? What are the colors we're using? What's the text that we're putting on the packaging? And then, well, what information do we put on the website? And what information do we put in our press release? So we created a list of all of the, the communication messaging. And then we created a grid and said, well, we have to make sure we cover everything. For blue consumers, we need to cover what they want to see. And for green consumers, who, by the way, the media likes the big issues. So they don't care if you have a beautiful bottle that much. But if you're taking on a big issue, that's pretty interesting for them. So we divided up our messaging um, I'm not, there's not one way to do this, but at least it, make sure you're covering all your bases. Uh, and, and thinking about the reptile in us, if you get a bottle of water, you want it to quench your thirst. You want it to make you feel good. So having some of those instinctive messages on the packaging made sense to us. And this is the first product we launched. It was a glass bottle, and we had gone not only to all the water sources to find the purest one we could find. But we went to the top design house in London, and they created a, a highly award. We won numerous design awards, and it really did show off a product that even if we weren't green, we would sell. And that was, I think, kind of the standard you want to work to. Don't rely on the green. Do all the extra work as well to make. And then you have a really overwhelming proposition. Now, having done that, kind of really focused on the reptile and mammal decision-making part of our customers' minds, then we went, had time to focus on the environmental innovation, which is why I, I was really interested in it. The first thing we did, I'll have to be quick here, um, was we launched the glass bottles because it was easy to get to market with, and we wanted time to find a way of making a plastic bottle that wasn't polluting. And that, with that time, we began looking at bioplastics. And it was early, well, I say early in the evolution of bioplastic. There's a lot more going on now. But at the time, we've, we came across a, a supplier who was making polylactic acid, which is plastic made from corn sugar, can also be made from other cellulosic plants. Um, and the problem was it was yellow. And so it took us a good six months of finding a way, and we didn't think we could sell bottled water in a yellow bottle. It wasn't going to be marketable. Uh, and so that was, there was a, quite a bit of getting things uh, sorted. But when we finally did get it to market, it was extraordinary. People who didn't care about or didn't know about all the environmental issues were just, uh, uh, sup not just surprised, but excited. Really, you've made a plastic bottle out of corn. It was so, it caught people's imagination so much that we got front page uh, tele, you know, newspaper uh, coverage, which you couldn't pay for. Uh, we had uh, you know, the, the internet, which was now coming along nicely at the time, 
went alive internationally with conversations about it. And I leave that as another opportunity. So while, you, while it may take extra time to invent a green product, you, make, you can make that back in the low-cost marketing uh, opportunities that come from it. So again, it's smart business. Other things that we did, um, I mentioned the, the, the Penguin Approved earlier about climate change. But just briefly on that, trying to market uh, you know, the climate change, it's fairly abstract. But what was, we thought, how can we get that message across in a way that's going to be emotional? And we thought, well, climate's going to melt the Arctic, and that could affect the polar bears and the penguins. Which one should we use? Let's go with penguins. And we found that actually was very effective. People could think about it in an emotional way. And again, we think it had more traction than talking about um, particulates and, and um, uh, amount of carbon in the air. And lastly, we discovered to our chagrin one day that our, our water didn't smell very good at the factory. So we went back up and you know, looked at all the options and we discovered that the bottle cap manufacturer for our glass bottles was putting in a little rubber liner but they were using polyvinyl chloride which is PVC which includes a uh, chemical phthalates that are softeners and these phthalates are actually endocrine disruptors which affect the formation of uh, children's you know, well, there's affects their health of pregnant women and young children. Well, quickly we went back and found an alternative supplier. And then we tested all of our competitors. And what did we find? That more than half also had this very same problem. We felt the media thought we might find this interesting, so we shared our research with them. And we got, again, national media coverage of a scandal that in, the one, in an industry that prides itself in providing nothing added, the one thing they were adding was something that no one should be consuming whatsoever. And again, the, the green R&D turned out to be a massive marketing opportunity and brought in a, a huge number of, of additional uh, consumers. Now, one other thing I should add to the marketing. So we've, we've covered, you want to appeal to the, uh, the, the, the blue consumers with quality. You, there's huge benefit in green R&D delivering marketing. But another, and this, this I, I can't take credit for this, this idea of leveraging social dynamics, where the first time I came across it uh, was reading Malcolm Gladwell's book, Tipping Point. And he made some really good point, uh, kind of insights. Most of you are aware of these probably. But if you find uh, opinion formers, they will shape the views of others. We do this all the time. We talk to our doctor to get medical advice. We don't talk to our you know, mechanic. So in the case of whatever industry you're in, if you find those early adopters who can appreciate what you're doing, they will spread the news. And how we saw that, in, and in the case of a, an eco product, if you, well, it's pretty easy to find the people that are interested in that, and they will tell others. Um, but one thing that I found very uh, powerful is that while they are greens, they are also rebellious. There's something rebellious about saying, even Elon Musk, you know, people, there's a bit of pride in saying the whole auto industry has spent 100 years saying electric cars aren't going to go very far and they don't look very good and they're not very powerful. And he's rebelled against that. And a lot of consumers are wanting to join that uh, rebellion. And if you if you look at green not just as saving the planet, but in a way rebelling against an industry who've been ignoring issues that really sh they, should, they should have been paying attention to, there's a bit of an opportunity for getting more and more people. So again, from a marketing point of view, being smart on how you position your product and engage people in your journey, your battle, is a, a very powerful way of, of getting more markets and more, more consumer support. Now I'm going to turn to uh, the latest project that I'm working on, and I'm going to walk you through kind of how, how all the lessons that I've learned thus far are going to be, how we're going to try to implement them on this. So I don't know if they'll work, but at least you can see how that might, that might work. The logo for our new, we're, we're launching a line of denim jeans, and on the back uh, pocket of uh, jeans. I think we all know the Levi's has a patch. It's the industry standard. 
And the patch we've designed, we've put a comet coming towards Earth. And obviously that's our symbolic way of referring to the limits to growth uh, forecast, that if we don't change, we're, you know, we might end up like the dinosaurs after the comet. Um, and, but again, that's not necessarily an emotional, um, thank you, that, has, that might kind of you know, make people pay attention for a moment, uh, might make them laugh, might make them scared, might, not make, that might, might, not, might make people not like us, I don't know. But what else are we going to do? Where is the emotional and instinctive connection? So um, the first thing is to identify the problem. And on this, I, I'm going to refer to Steve Jobs and Apple. One of his key kind of strategies is when he was looking at uh, his products that he brought to market was to always find an enemy. And in his case, it was the boring IBM, and no, you know, I apologize to the PC owners, but you know, Microsoft and IBM, they, were, they weren't fun. They weren't user-friendly. They, they weren't intuitive. And so he wanted to, he always had them as, as somebody he could be fighting against. In our case, we don't have to look far. Uh, the cotton industry, which is what most genes are made of, is, well, I should actually back up. The textile industry in general is the most polluting industry after the oil industry. So there's a big problem. And within textiles, the biggest polluter is cotton. So we're going into a market with a, which is one of the biggest markets that needs to be addressed. And yet, before I got involved in this, I didn't know much about it. I'm assuming most consumers aren't aware that cotton is a massive problem. But again, that's eco-warrior uh, talk. It will, some people will be interested in it. But we need to engage people on other levels. Well, so in investigating our product, when I looked at our whole life cycle of where our product comes from, how do we manufacture it, what alternatives, one of the things that we discovered was that the original genes, in fact, where the word genes comes from, was from Italy. And in the 12th century, the Genoese were one of the biggest navies in the world. And they made their giant canvas sails out of canvas, or they called it canape. In Chinese, it's, it's called ma, English hemp. And the reason they used it was it's twice as durable as cotton, and it doesn't rot in seawater. But eventually the sails would get worn, and the sailors would cut up the jeans, uh, cut up the sails and make trousers. And so they would sail around the, the, the Mediterranean, and when they got to France, the French would say, oh, it's the, they, they didn't say Genoa like the Italians, they said Jean. So that's where the original concept for genes came from. Although I, I think, to be fair, uh, the Chinese have been using this material, ma, to make fabric for 10,000 years. So uh, they don't call it, you might not call them genes, but I think that the Chinese have just as good a claim to this, this material. And this story, however, is really important because the current marketing around denim jeans comes from my country. The biggest brand is Levi's, and it's marketed around the cowboys. And then it was the miners, and then it was the motorcyclists. But actually, the original jeans, in terms of uh, the popular use of the term, comes from not from cotton denim, but actually from uh, hemp fabric. So we have another story that we can pull on and engage, engage people. My uh, graphics didn't quite come out as planned, but um, if you look at the photo, the other advantage is they're twice as tough. And in the denim market, uh, the, uh, being tough is a huge uh, factor. So we actually have that to, to engage people on, and therefore arguably more cost effective. So, and then last but not least, like all clothing companies, we need to be stylish. We need to have a good-looking product. So we put a lot of effort and time into that. We're not just relying on being sustainable. But of course, we are going to be the most sustainable. So hopefully that combination of having quite a few benefits on the product aside from the environmental, and then also having the most powerful environmental story will give us a really strong place to get into the market and disrupt it. Um, and then finally, and I go back to that blue marketing, 
we're absolutely going to be a rebel. We're, we're rebelling against an, an, I say entrenched, but the incumbent business, but with a really interesting story. And we hope to gauge people's sense of enjoying fighting back to join us. Um, my time is up, so I'll, I'll have to kind of end here. But uh, we're always um, welcome. We hope to bring our product to Taiwan as one of the first markets we go to. And we may even want to do some manufacturing here. So if there's anyone in the audience who would be open to helping us, my email is there. We'd love to talk to you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay on the stage. Okay. 大家给他一个更热烈的掌声。好，那我们接下来呢是Q&A的时段哦，所以大家可以赶快拿出你袋子里面的提问单，然后把你的问题写写下来，然后呢递给我们的工作人员。So thank you, Reed, so much for sharing your experience. And we can really see your passion and deep knowledge on green innovation. And it's really amazing that you have made bigger and bigger impact along the way. Um, I noticed that at the beginning of the speech, you can speak Chinese pretty well. So <laughs> for the next following Q&A session, I'm going to give you a little challenge. I'm going to read every question in Mandarin. <laughs> and let's see how much you can know. You cannot cheat. <laughs> let's see how much you can understand. No, no, no. <laughs> I, sadly, I, I know a few words, um, and, and I'm happy to tell you the story. But I, when I was uh, 23, I had the opportunity to teach English in Guangzhou. And so it was a while ago. And, but I, I learned Yi Dian Dian Putonghua. But I don't remember it very well, so I won't be able to keep up with you. Okay, okay, I'm just kidding. Okay, so in the Q&A, I will use Chinese to ask questions. Okay, so first question. Okay, 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 first question. Um, well, I have to say that uh, going to the night market was actually quite wonderful. So I, I, I wasn't there thinking about business. I was just <laughs> in awe of the, uh, everything that was happening. But the one thing that, I, uh, that the night market reminds me of, it's the same thing when I go into an English or an American uh, supermarket or shopping market or for that matter, the ones I've been to in Taiwan, is that there are, in a typical English supermarket, something like 10 to 40,000 products. There's a huge number of, of products. And very few of them have gone through the thought process that I was explaining earlier. And what it effectively means is it's a huge opportunity. And when I was young and I you know, had various jobs. Uh, I worked in an ice cream shop. I worked in a fishing cannery. Um, I didn't really enjoy those jobs. I was very eager to do something else. But you know, what what can you do? Like, where are the where are the opportunities? Who is going to hire you? But if you realize as a young person that actually there's a huge opportunity that the existing businesses have not done yet. And one good example. Uh, working in drinks, we found that trying to get into certain re, uh, uh, retail outlets was very hard because Coca-Cola or Pepsi uh, or Danone or Nestle had the majority of the market. They didn't want a new product. But having a green product, well, not, those companies did not have that. It gave us an opportunity to, do, to get into retail. And I think that's, um, so when I walk into these, the night market or, or any store, what I see is uh, the potential for outsiders to have a chance to, to compete. 
，谢谢。好，所以大家呃，台中人住逢甲夜市的注意喽。你今天去逢甲夜市的时候，可以看一看哦，有什么纸餐盒啊、纸杯啊，或者是什么产品啊，可以变得更环保。那可能就是你创业的机会哦。好，那哎，大家那个如果有题有问题的话，可以赶快递交给我们的工作人员。好，那我想要再请教一下 Rain， 就是好，当你看到一个商机，然后你看到这些机会，然后你在思考要怎么样呃做出这个绿色产品的时候，你认为什么是让这个产品可以脱颖而出，赢得主流市场的关键？嗯、<笑>我们给他一点时间。嗯、um, ，I think the you know so what's the unique？ 呃、uh, ，I think。This isn't just for green products. Every business manager is asking themselves, whether they're in the clothing industry or the auto industry or the computer industry, what's the unique selling proposition that's going to give us an advantage?、Um, and I think that that, as I, I hopefully explained, that process needs to stay the same. You need to have a product that people want. But what green innovation offers, even though it does mean you have to learn more things, but it gives you, if you can match the competition on those other elements, something more that they don't have. So I suppose I,、uh, I'm, I'm, I go back to the diagram of all the, the problems the planet's facing and think, which industries have a have some connection. To an important issue that I can use in my marketing later on, and that's what I'm trying to to always evaluate. 那哦，有这个问题呢，是关于你的之前创办的公司 Blue Water、哦。他说，有人觉得呢，喝瓶装水呢，其实是会制造很多的碳足迹哦。然后可能会伤害地球，所以他想知道当初你为什么不倡导说大家就在家喝那些过滤煮沸的开水就好？你为什么还想要去卖瓶装水 ？Um, that's a great question, and and we have been, you know, I've been asked that、uh, really fairly bef、um, before. A couple of things. The first of all, I do. I, I actually think the best thing to do is to drink water from the tap if the tap is healthy. And some countries, though, the tap water is not healthy. And, and funny enough,、uh, in some places, people are giving their children Coca-Cola because the tap water is not safe. And in that instance, it's better to give them bottled water than Coca-Cola.、Um, So in some parts of the world, bottled water sadly is、um, can be a very valuable or useful thing.、Um, the so I have no excuse for it. I would say do not, and, and we were very clear in our communication because we were a non effectively a nonprofit. So we didn't have shareholders saying make us as much money. We could be very honest, and we were very honest in saying this is not the first thing you should do. But if you are going to buy a bottle of water, then buy one made from corn, or buy one that's carbon neutral, or one that is、uh, not contributing some other problem. So, all industries have some negative impact. The, the case was, can we reduce that impact as much as possible? 谢谢 Ray 的回答哦，因为其实这一题我也很有感觉，因为我觉得要推广环保，就是我们生活中有非常多的事情、生活习惯是可以改变，变得更环保，可以用绿、更绿色的商品。但是有的时候习惯的养成是需要时间的，改变也是需要渐进式的。所以，呃，我我觉得 Ray 其实当初选择瓶装水来作为一个呃创业的起点，其实是一个很好的策略哦，因为他面对的是一个广大的市场，每个人都需要喝水。那每个人在外面可能都会有需要购买瓶装水的时候，那呃，那有一个问题就是说，其实台湾现在有越来越多的绿色的产品，比方说玻璃吸管啊，或者是一个叫好日子的团队 A Good Day 他们开发的食物袋啊，那这些商品呢，不见得是我们每一天生活的必需品哦。所以像针对这一类的产品，你觉得要怎么样去呃？打进主流市场，去改变人们的消费习惯，让人们愿意去购买这些可能是不是这么啊、呃、每天都会用到的商品，然后但是是环保的。嗯、um, ，the 
I apologize if I'm going to repeat some of the things I said earlier. I think the, the main takeaway of, of the lessons I've learned, and which I tried to summarize, um, is that you want a high quality product. But most of the products in, this, in the supermarkets are in, in English what we call commodities. They're the same. So the rice, well, most rice is more or less the same. Most uh, toothbrushes are more or less the same. And so, at a, so if you have an environmental story and, and all the other products are kind of boring effectively, you create a whole opportunity for communication. So I would, I, again, I go back. Um, but, the key, but if you have the green product, then it's a question of storytelling. And if you can, if, it's one thing to say it's eco-friendly. People have heard that a lot, and, it, and maybe that's becoming a little too boring, actually. So what do you mean eco-friendly? How is it eco-friendly? What issue is it addressing? And there's a huge, and as I showed, there's a, you know, at least 12 major areas for storytelling around the environment. And most companies don't get into that level of detail, but I think customers will be interested in that. So I would use the story to engage people. 那在下一题呢，又是关于你的 Blue Water 的这个企业哦，就是你哦，你刚刚有提到说你的那个瓶盖，就是你会把瓶盖的呃这个，你你有呃开发了一个真正可以分解、可以回收的一个瓶盖，那把瓶盖对环境的影响公布出去，对于传统瓶盖的制造商，你觉得有带来什么冲击吗？然后当时有没有碰到什么样子的呃回响？ Um, we've worked on caps in, in, in a range of ways. So we, in, in one story I told was about finding chemicals in the caps. We have also worked on making biodegradable caps for our biodegradable bottle. We're also working on recyclable caps for traditional uh, plastic bottles. So, um, but what is, is really interesting and we're dealing with this right now on, on, in our, our denim uh, project around the dyes and materials, is that there are quite a few suppliers, whether it's caps or clothing, who have realized that eco-friendly is important. And so they have, they have started marketing eco-friendly dyes, eco-friendly um, cloth, for example. Um, but I know a lot about the environment because I've been paying attention, um, and, and most of it is not as eco-friendly as they would like to think. Yes, it's a little better, but it's not the best. Mm -hmm. And I go back to the, the penguin. If you can find the best, nobody can beat you. Why, why go halfway? Why not go all the way? And, but the impact of, on the supply chain is if they realize, when they hear me say, I'm not so sure, I'm, I'm very polite, I try to be polite, but when I don't buy their eco product and say, oh, I'm going to do that instead, I am certain that their board of directors will hear about it and they'll think, oh, maybe we should do that too. So I think eco entrepreneurs can definitely influence the supply chain. Right. Okay. Now, uh 刚刚就在延续这个题目，就是说，其实对传统企业来说，它因为要生存嘛，要要有利润嘛，所以它比较一开始可能不会直接以环保为做考量。那你觉得政府部门呢，可以怎么样引导企业，然后往更加环保、更加永续的方向前进？虽然你不是政府的官员，可是这个呃，民众希望你就一个社会企业的创业者、经营者的角度来提出你的看法。就政府可以怎么样帮助企业更加的环保跟永续 um, ？This is a great question,、um, and I have two points.、Um, the first is something that came out of the investment community called the Carbon Disclosure Project, and a group of investors said to businesses,、uh, "We won't invest in you unless you disclose and are transparent on the carbon footprint of your product." And if Greenpeace had asked, or a newspaper had asked, the businesses would probably just have ignored them. But when their investors start asking, then all of a sudden, well, they do want investment to grow, so、uh, they actually paid attention. 
And it has allowed, the, and, and, and as a result of that, the companies actually discovered where they were wasting energy or causing problems. So it was very good for those businesses to do it, but it showed the value of outside um, measurement, by the outside people measuring them. And I think the government has, could have a huge role in that on one key thing. Uh, again, transparency on what chemicals go into products. It is most companies I've dealt with hide behind trade secrecy. Well, we can't tell you what's in it, but it's, it meets the regulations. Well, who made those regulations? Usually the lawyers for the industry working with government, and no offense to government, but sometimes government's influenced by those same industries. So I think that I don't trust, I personally don't trust regulations because I feel that unless it's transparent, I want to know what is in these products. And government could make that a requirement. And I think that would, be, would change a lot of businesses for the better. It still allow for capitalism, but for eco-capitalism. Thank you. 那呃呃，瑞、呃、你有创办那个 One Earth Innovation 的这个绿色孵化器嘛？那你你已经帮助过很多企业去开发非常呃永续，然后呢 CP 值高，然后又可以吸引大众的一些商品。那你觉得是呃要达到这样子的事情，你有什么样的诀窍？有什么样的关键？怎么样去吸引这些 Blue Consumers？ Um, well, the problem with the, the, that I've, my biggest problem, I'll t there's two questions there, is, is time. I would love to work on lots of projects. There's so many interesting projects, but I find if I try to do too many, nothing gets done. So actually, it sounds very nice to be working on lots of things, and actually you learn from working in different industries. You can take things you learned from here and apply them there. Um, but it also is important to drill down and really know a lot about one industry so you can do it right. Um, so I, I, I suppose if there's a, a lesson there is to, m before you move on to multiple things, to make sure you really properly understand the, the, the details of the industry you're in. But what's remarkable and kind of exciting is by doing that research, and I. I would refer to that as a life cycle assessment and as one way of looking at all the aspects of your business. But from that comes ideas. You, you'll be surprised. Oh, if we do that, we can do this. So there's great uh, innovation that comes from looking at the environmental impact of a company. Thank you. 好，那我因为时间的关系，我们就问最后一个问题哦，就是有人很好奇说，瑞在啊做 Blue Water 跟 One Earth Innovation 之前。你从事什么样的工作啊？这个题目我其实可以先帮他回答哦。他之前是一个呃新闻工作者，然后也是一个 filmmaker。好，那但是呢，他后来却进入了这个绿色环保的领域哦。然后可能是他之前不是很熟悉的，所以想要请教一下，就是呃，你会给同样想要进入呃可能是环保的领域，或者是进入一个社会的议题，但是他本身没有呃相对应的学经历的背景，你会给这些人什么样的建议？你觉得他们可以怎么开始 um, ？That's a, a really good question, and、uh, because obviously, if you don't know how to do something, you think, "Oh, I can't do it," or "How am I going to get started?" But I think that there's an advantage to to being new to something.、Um, I'll tell you a little story、uh, that always sticks in my mind about a circus where there is an elephant. It's a small elephant. And they don't want it to run away, so they tie its leg to. They, they tie a rope to its leg and put a stake in the ground.、And、the elephant tries to get away, but it cannot. But over time, the elephant gets very big. It's so big it could easily pull its leg away from the stake, but it never does because it thinks it can't. The advantage of being the young elephant is you are willing to try. So if you're new to an industry. One advantage that you have over people who have been in it for 30 years and know everything is that they know everything, but they actually stop thinking.、Uh, whereas if you're new, you'll come and say, "Well, why is this? Why can't we do this? Why can't we change?" So while you have a you have a lot to learn, 
you also bring some uh, new vision to the problem. Um, so I, I would say that, and, and I th the, the, I'll go back to my favorite example uh, nowadays is Elon Musk. He had a background in tech and then in finance. He didn't have a background in cars, and his company is the number one or two rated uh, you know, most valuable car companies in the USA. How did he, did, how did he do that? Uh, it's extraordinary. But I think that, that is, uh, it shows that actually, in a way, businesses need fresh thinking, and so why can't anyone try? 谢谢，哦、uh, ，我觉得呃， uh, 今天呢，其实真的非常谢谢 Reed 的分享。然后我在他身上看到一个很棒的特质，就是他看到很多问题，或者是看到很多事情的时候，他看到的是机会哦，不是问题哦。比方说，他走进商呃超商，走进夜市，他看到很多绿色的商机，然后看到说 ，OK， 我们没有相对应的背景。呃，好像我们会觉得这是一个劣势，但是他看到的是一个优势，因为这代表我们没有被框架局限住。那只要我们花更多的功夫去呃做一些 research， 去去找资料，其实我们也可以发挥更大的影响力。那今天再一次，我们用最热烈的掌声，谢谢 Ree 跟我们分享他十几年的经验，谢谢。谢谢 okay.